So I'm very pleased that we have made it through almost the entire conference. Um, we are up to our last presenter of the day in our session on negotiations and collaborations during and after a crisis. And I'm very pleased today to be able to present to you once again, after our Haiti panel of the other night, Dr. Richard Kieran, Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture at the Smithsonian Institution. And I have to say that um, for me, Richard really represents, I don't know, it's so corny, but putting the A in action, really um, seeing what needs to be done, identifying the gaps, coordinating and collaborating with a number of partners, everybody from the doers to the funders. And so in, in a microcosm has been expressing the values that we're trying to really institutionalize and establish at this conference here today. He's been doing this for an entire career here at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, please welcome him in talking about a case study of organizing help in a crisis at the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, Dr. Richard Curran. Thank you, uh, thank you, Q uh, Corey, and thank you, uh, everybody. Whoops, how do I do that? Uh-oh, does that work? Okay, that works. Okay, great, so the, um, uh, um, the other, I'm gonna talk quickly because I have to catch a plane. So, <laughs> so um, I, I, you know, this has been inspirational, hearing from everybody, all of you uh, uh, here over the last few days. It's just tremendous work, and a lot of people doing work at cost of personal, uh, um, you know, your own persons, your own careers, uh, emotional stability, frustration, everything else. It, it's, just, it's just marvelous to uh, see. Today I wanted to talk about with some granularity, because uh, Stephanie's presented, Olson's presented about Haiti, other people have talked about it, we talked about it, we did the panel uh, the other night, but I wanted to talk about it, like how do you get something started? And, and what are the barriers? Because to me it's kind of much more idiosyncratic, it is idiosyncratic, uh, and that's the problem. There's really a, a very little uh, pathway to doing stuff. So. Well, that doesn't work. Okay. So with Haiti, uh, you know, went through the other night, the earthquake, the tremendous destruction, uh, how, you know, we in the United States felt that, but it was really the Haitians first that came in and, you know, thought that culture was important to them, going into the rubble, saving things, getting instruments out of collapsing museums. Uh, ISPAN, the cultural heritage organization in Haiti, Daniel Ali, goes out on his motorcycle and starts labeling buildings because everything is, uh, you know, uh, things have fallen down, uh, crushed, and he starts paint, sp uh, spray painting buildings. Don't bulldoze this building. <laughs> this is historically significant. That was tremendous work. And of course, publishing uh, this bulletin that goes around the world that alerted other heritage professionals about what was happening. Um, I think soon after the earthquake, a, a real cultural leader in uh, Haiti, uh, Patrick Villar, who we'd work with at the Smithsonian, uh, you know, it was quoted uh, on the front page of the New York Times uh, with this quote. And, you know, it brought home to us that people, there were Haitians, not all Haitians, but a lot of Haitians, and Patrick recommend, uh, uh, you know, uh, expressed that sentiment, cared about who they were, their heritage, what that meant to them, what gave meaning to their survival and life. And so we had this uh, relationship with a lot of Haitian cultural leaders, as a result of previous Smithsonian uh, programs. And, you know, we were pretty well poised. So Patrick De La Tour up there in the top left had been a fellow in this museum back in the 1980s at the Smithsonian, prior relationship. He was the Minister of Tourism, and now he was being put in charge by the President of Haiti in charge of the emergency and reconstruction. Jerry Benoit had been a curator at the Smithsonian, was the former First Lady of Haiti. Patrick Villard worked with the Smithsonian. Olson had coordinated stuff. We knew the president. Uh, we knew the prime minister, uh, who was uh, also involved uh, uh, in organizations in Haiti. We'd worked with uh, Giselle Florent, who had sold uh, crafts at the Folklife Festival. Leslie Voltaire had been a, a minister. Uh, 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 Georges Nader. So there was a whole network of Haitians that we already knew and had established relationships. There was a position of trust to start from. If we had started from zero, this couldn't have happened. On the U.S. side, we had folks within the Smithsonian. Diana Jai was here the other day. Jeanetta Cole, the head of our African Art Museum. 
Uh, people who had some track record with Haiti, you shock, you've been trained in the AIC CERT program uh, funded by IMLS. And so we met at the Smithsonian. We started thinking, just like anybody does, just like any of us would in an emergency, what do you do? How can you help? This is a, this is a, a tragedy, and for us, a cultural tragedy. What could we do? So at the Smithsonian, we started meeting. We never really done anything like this uh, and trying to figure out on a grand scale what to do. Katrina was somewhat of a model, almost a negative model. Uh, Bob Kessler in the uh, uh, unit here, uh, MCI at the Smithsonian, had helped out at Tulane on a, co on a collection. Uh, Lonnie Bunch and I had helped out after Katrina. But basically, we had a boss at the Smithsonian who at that time said, not our business. What do we care about what's happening in New Orleans? And if people want to volunteer and do stuff on the, can, on the side, go ahead. But basically, no institutional response when we have people in need. And, and I think to me, you know, some people say, well, why, we, why should the Smithsonian, why should museums be interested in this? And to me, the whole idea is, you know, if you look at the natural world, our, our, people in natural sciences and even in zoos have gotten the message that the museum is a means, not an end. The museum is a, is a means to help understand, preserve, encourage an understanding of culture and history or na and natural history. You don't just put birds in a case, you know, to show them off for kids on a Saturday morning. The idea is that museums have evolved an idea that somehow that understanding of species and ecologies and environments is a way of helping beyond the walls of the museum in terms of saving the world. So I think in culture, you know, there's still a very strong sense of the aggrandizement and the fetishism of the museum rather than its larger purpose of what it does within the world. And I think we started to see that. It was fortunate at that time Larry Wall is not here today, was at that time. We had our first ever after 168 years of existence at the Smithsonian and the State Department, an actual liaison between the State Department and Smithsonian. So we actually could talk to each other and communicate, and the Smithsonian could say to state, hey, we'd really like to do stuff. And Rick Ruth and others over at the State Department uh, were very um, uh, receptive to that, and we really started, were able to have a dialogue. I had described the other night the meeting we had over at the uh, American Association of Museums, Corey Wagner going around the table, Smithsonian, National Archives, National Cultural Agencies, Defense, State, everybody around the table, who's gonna help the Haitians? We're hearing these cries for support, Who's going to help? Corey was great. She seemed to know what she was doing. I just happened to be the last person at the table. And I said, I can't believe the US government cannot put this together. I heard from Corey and then from Errol Wentworth, I said, because Errol and AIC had trained all these conservators to be able to respond to information. But Errol didn't know anybody in Haiti. Corey and Blue Shield didn't have a dime. And so how can you put money, organization, government, and people together to make something happen. So uh, between uh, Corey and Errol, I thought, gee, we could maybe do a plan. And then I went to the head of the uh, President's Committee for Arts and Humanities at the White House, Rachel Goslins, and she got it because she got the failure of the US to deal with uh, um, the invasion of Iraq, looting of the uh, museum in Baghdad, and also the failure during Katrina. And she said, we can't let that happen again. So she went to the other uh, 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 agencies, uh, IMLS, NEA, NEH, and said, hey, we need to do something, because everybody serves on that president's committee. There was a woman on that who's the co-chair with George Stevens, Margo Lyon. She's a, Hollywood she's a Broadway producer. And Margo then, she would be willing to talk to her friends and help us get some money. And the, the whole, you know, Kerry Washington, Sarah Jessica Parker, Chuck Close, you know, my, all these people came forward and said, we are willing to help, we understand. Rachel also had a good friend, General Nolan Bivens, a guy familiar with the arts, but he also knew, I'm an anthropologist, ethnography, did most of my work, Pakistan and, and India. Bivens was an, ethnography of the, uh, an ethnographer of the military. He knew who to go to in the Pentagon. He knew, that he knew the pathways. He knew how to make stuff happen. And of course, we had an international colleague, our partner's uh, boss, uh, Munir Bushnaki, who we, we uh, basically uh, uh, conspired in uh, Rome and then in Paris to figure out, because UNESCO had called a great conference in February, like a month after the earthquake. And at UNESCO, God bless UNESCO. I love it. I've done a lot of work. It's a place where people talk a lot. One of my teachers in my career at the Smithsonian was a woman, Bernice uh, Johnson Reagan. 
uh, one of the founders of uh, SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Civil Rights Movement, founding member of Sweet Honey and the Rock, Dr. Paul Bernice always said, and he was a curator here at the Smithsonian, she said, Richard, is this a do committee or is this a talk committee? And a lot of people, when there's a crisis, end up doing a lot of talking. We needed to do something. And of course, as I described, we had uh, Stephanie Hornbeck, who had just uh, 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 retired from African art as a conservator. So I felt we had like elements in. Uh, when we first went down to Haiti, Corey, myself, uh, Diane, and Jai, we first thought that in this plot of land here, out in Haiti, we would kind of build tents. We kind of like do a folk life festival on the mall, only we do it in Haiti. We'd get tents, generators, portageons, and we'd be able to mount the base, and we'd have uh, you know, cots, and people could come down and volunteer. We'd get uh, 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 Errol and Eric over at AIC could organize people come down, we build it. We met with General Keene, who's the head of the uh, task force, US troops in Haiti. He said, I'd love to help you out. And we eyed covetously his tents, his generators, his portage on. said, wow, if you could get it. What I learned is the military doesn't own that. They contract it out. So then we had to figure out how can the military, how can the Pentagon transfer contracts to the Smithsonian? He said, I need two things. One, we have to figure out bureaucratically how we could do that. And then two, somebody has to give me an order. Somebody has to tell me it's okay to do it. So as it turns out, the day we came back from Haiti, in this museum, Michelle, just, just upstairs, Michelle Obama was donating her inaugural gown to the Smithsonian. So you have a chance to talk to the First Lady of the United States and say, hey, this is what's happening in Haiti. We would like to help out. Can you give General Keene an order? <laughs> <coughs> and actually, I had to find a precedent back when Jackie Kennedy had written to the Smithsonian to help save a building opposite the White House, the Renwick Gallery. It was Jackie Kennedy that helped do that. And so we actually used Jackie Kennedy helping save an historic building in Washington as a precedent for First Lady's action. And she, called, she as it turns out, over at Blair House that very day, she was hosting Elizabeth uh, 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 Preval, First Lady of Haiti. She said, I just talked to these people at the Smithsonian. They want to do this stuff. Go over and talk to Dr. Curran over at the Smithsonian. So all of a sudden now, in one day, I have two first ladies saying, hey, do I got a deal for you? And of course, then uh, the uh, 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 word went back to uh, an old friend who I'd worked at years, with years ago, uh, Cheryl Mills at the State Department. And Cheryl, uh, 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 Cheryl was uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. So all of a sudden, we have that cable somewhere. I think we saved it somewhere in the Smithsonian, like the State Department. State Department sending a cable to General Keene in the Department of Defense helped the Smithsonian do culture. That's kind of what it took. Now, that's scary to me that it kind of takes that kind of thing to make something that, that's pretty simple happening. The other thing is note that whenever you have a crisis, emergent crisis, everybody wants to help. And sometimes in that desire for everybody to help, it slows stuff down because nobody knows who's in charge. And you have some people who, who want to help, but they don't have money. Other people feel they have authority. So we had in Haiti itself, not only internationally, because we had different international organizations all saying, OK, we're taking the lead in Haiti. But nobody has any money. Nobody has an organization. Nobody has any legal authority to do anything. So how do you put that together? Similarly, in Haiti, Different ministries thought that they were in charge. And so you're, you're you know, it, it's, there's, there's very little coordination. And people are kind of talking with, at, through each other, but figuring out what indeed uh, is the route to making stuff happen. In the midst of this, we were sending people down from the Smithsonian, some of the people in this room, to survey situations, working with Errol and her group, to send conservators down. Uh, to take a look, to assess collections, meet with people from museums, galleries, and so on, to at least get a sense of if we were going to respond, what would that look like? And where would that be? And so there was a lot of politicking. So at the same time, we had first ladies and uh, uh, people involved in, in, in the project and wanting to do something with Haiti. It was just figuring out in a very practical way, where are we going to mount something? How are we going to pay for it? How is this going to happen? The key thing that did happen in this case is there was no money. I mean, they, each of the cultural agencies said, we'll put up $30,000 a piece. 
NEA, NEA, HI on the list. $90,000, what can you do with that? And it was uh, the president's committee, uh, Margot Lyon, who basically said, look, let me go to the New Yorkers. And she went to the Broadway League. They had some money. They had raised a few, like $300,000. And they said, we want to give it to Haiti. Why do you want to give it to Haiti? And for New Yorkers, I'm a native New Yorker, so I can be a little proud of this. <clears throat> the New Yorkers said, look, after 9-11, after our disaster in New York, we knew how important it was to get Broadway up and running. It showed that New York was not down, that we were back. The culture was a symbol of being alive. They were saying something that was no different from Patrick Villar in Haiti. And so they said, this earthquake in Haiti is their 9-11. And getting art and culture back up in Haiti is the equivalent to us getting up Broadway. So they basically, they charged a bucket ticket uh, for uh, an extra bucket ticket for Broadway, uh, people going to shows, they donated to the project. So now we had some money. So we finally put together, now in doing this and putting together different agencies for this, we must have written, and thank God for the Smithsonian's legal department, we drove them crazy. I mean, literally dozens of MOUs on the fly with different ministers of Haiti, with different US agencies, with different organizations, in terms of putting together a kind of legal, quasi-legal framework, so at least you could have agencies moving stuff. We still had an issue with money. The US aid, uh, uh, aid bill for Haiti, and that was a few billion dollars going to Haiti relief, did not go through. The earthquake was in January 2010. The bill did not go through till August 2011. So if you're talking about you know, like an emergency response, like 18 months later. You know, it's like my basement's flooded and I need to do something tomorrow and oh, wait 18 months, it'll get done. So basically, I had a very, we had a very empathetic uh, boss who knew about uh, earthquakes uh, and relief in Wayne Clough, and the Smithsonian basically advanced the project about $2 million. Okay, if you didn't have somebody doing something like that, even with the Broadway League and the other agency money, it wasn't going to happen. So basically, we had money in the bank. We had all these organizations collaborating at one level or another, playing their part. And the big issue, and I think as Olson talked about the other day, was getting the various Haitian public institutions together and corralling them and giving the legal authorities in Haiti. You, you know, Jesse captured it very well. You, you, you kind of walk in, you're not walking into a blank slate, you're walking into situations where there's a complexity of local politics, arrangements, power arrangements, power blocks, and so on, about what people want to see and don't want to see. And so we had to work through uh, the various governmental agencies uh, in Haiti who have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of in independence, their, their directors and so on. Uh, and we weren't successful any, uh, in, in all cases. I think Evie Oler and others the other night talked about our uh, uh, acquiring this uh, building. I think it was thirty-eight or forty thousand dollars a month. Complicated lease. You know, the Smithsonian takes a long time to rent, like one place. Here we were renting something in an emergency situation, but really had our colleagues with boots on the ground uh, to be able to uh, in inspect and assure safety of uh, people and things in in the uh, in our headquarters. And Olson uh, and colleagues, and with Stephanie, put together a, a great local staff uh, that really made uh, uh, things work. I think our biggest thing was building relationships with those cultural organizations on the ground so people saw this not as an internet, as a US, the US has invaded Haiti a few times. Okay, don't see this as you know, kind of cultural hegemony, culture, but working with people to what they thought was important. I think Olson and Stephanie ended up defining these projects with different organizations in Haiti where they saw this was in their benefit. Now in some cases it took a lot of these organizations like Santa Art and so on, a lot of the leadership was killed in the earthquake. With other places where there was no leadership because of uh, deaths, injuries, and destruction and so on. So it took a lot of work to build trust, to build, to say, hey, you know, bring your treasures to our place and we'll take care of them. Right. And so it took a lot of work, a lot of work on the ground where people became part of the process, trained in it, developing projects and so on. And we worked with uh, you know, dozens of uh, uh, private individuals, private collections, 
uh, people who had their life stake in these, uh, in these materials. And a uh, great relationship with Aparna and Ikram in terms of teaching and training. Again, we had to count every piece of paper for every one of 35,000 items treated uh, and dealt with uh, and deploying all the conservators to do the work. We brought the President's Committee down to Haiti for discussion with Haitian colleagues to work out plans to see stuff for themselves. So we maintain that high level of Haitian support and U.S. government support. And then you had high officials of the U.S. meeting the president of Haiti and doing all that. It was a little disruptive in Haiti because he wanted to keep us all safe. So his own, you know, kind of equivalent of a Secret Service protection had to protect us in Haiti during those uh, uh, few days. But it gave people tremendous insight into what was happening there and support. And of course, uh, Aparna and Smithsonian conservators doing training, working directly with people made some happen, and you've seen some of these slides before about retrieving and saving artworks and murals and so on, uh, and uh, working with libraries and uh, in some cases. Now, not everything was successful. The head of the uh, National Cathedral had been uh, killed in the earthquake. We wanted to save, we sent the guy down to survey this, uh, Kessler Pierre, wonderful. In the midst of Haiti's earthquake, who would think, this is what the cathedral looked like, steel bent, yet glass survived. Amazing. We tried to save that glass. We wanted to do a project with the National Cathedral. Unfortunately, there was no part. We finally got permission. I think also it was Christmas, right? It was like just around Christmas time. And by then, the glass had been looted, and pieces of glass were showing up on eBay for $5 a piece. The Bureau of Ethnology uh, and the Museum of Haitian Art uh, both, I think, a lack of leadership. We had a person who was the head of the uh, Ethnology Museum who basically held her own collection hostage <laughs> and would not let us help save that. And it was so frustrating, visit after visit, to see collections right there on the lawn. But the, the you know, person wasn't going to be moved and did not really want to save their collection. We had, in some cases, like audiovisual collections, really dispersed, no central authority in the issue of what to do about all this documentation of plays, performance, rituals, Haiti's intangible cultural heritage, really never worked out a solution. In terms of doing the project, uh, and I think Richard will talk more about it in commentary, we narrowed down on what we would look at in terms of both culture and considering and heritage. And we stayed away from the big sites and buildings because that would take a long time and tens of millions of dollars. And we had a lot of proposals and a lot of jockeying around with what to do with living cultural traditions. Haitians have very powerful hanfors, these local areas where you have neighborhood uh, voodoo rituals that are very important to the heart of the community. We didn't have the expertise. We just never really were able to come up with a plan of how to deal with, ha with, with Haiti's living cultural heritage, particularly in, a, in an environment where you had you know, two million people living in tents and, and a great dispersal. And uh, it's not for want of trying, it's just we did not have that kind of insight. Collections seemed to be the place where there was an immediate need that we felt we could uh, uh, do something uh, with. Uh, we also had some false starts and so on. So after the first two years of the project, we, we were tired of paying rent. We thought a permanent place would do because Haiti had an, uh, an ongoing need. And I think just as we heard from Jesse with the project in Erbil, so we were moving toward, uh, we got the rights to demolish a wobbly, termite-infested building uh, near the presidential palace. We got the money. We did that. Uh, and then um, uh, the government changed. We had a hard time in doing that. We felt there was an ongoing need to do more than the workshops and start training people longer term basis. One of the volunteers, Mark Aronson, who worked at Yale, he was very taken by his, uh, his uh, experience and said, let's train Haitians on a longer term basis. They can come up to New Haven, work with our material. So we thought that was great. Yale put out kind of the support for that. It was wonderful. Although I had in the back of my mind this worry like, Okay, so these Haitians are going to go up to Yale to work at the Center for British Art, right? <laughs> like Haitians, fiercely independent, abolished slavery, provided a model for people around the world, and they're going to work on paintings of, you know, white guys with wigs? <laughs> and then something fantastic happens. 
And I think I found this through the project. Amazing, serendipitous, wonderful things would happen. So Mark says, well, you know, actually, I'm looking in the collections of the Peabody, and we found these 19 portraits of Haitian leaders from the, from the 19th century. Amazing. I said, where'd you get those? I said, well, we looked on the back of the paintings. It says Smithsonian. <laughs> threw us for a loop. These were done in the 1870s. They were commissioned. They came back to the US. And uh, they were deaccessioned by the Smithsonian, by Dylan Ripley, guy had hired me here, uh, in the 1960s to an anthropologist, Sid Mintz, and uh, Richard Morse, uh, who were uh, at Yale at the time. And so I thought it was amazing that here were Haitian conservators now up at Yale working on these Haitian paintings, uh, which they continue to do. In the meantime, we switched partners. The government wasn't working out, so we switched to Cascade University. Jackie Lamarck, the head of it, really reasonable guy, uh, uh, although we had to deal with a new president, uh, Marta Lee. And there we had a great friend and an ambassador, Pam White, who was able to do the needful in terms of getting the government not to stop us. And sometimes you need the government to cooperate, and sometimes you need the government to just get out of the way. And, uh, and we face both uh, in this uh, case. And you get enmeshed in, in all sorts of issues. Jackie Lamarck was going to run for president and was disqualified in the current election. So it, you know, th th this kind of thing continues. But uh, as you've heard from Stephanie and Olson, we did open up uh, this conservation center at Kiskei. And I think, as Stephanie said about Jesse's presentation, Erbil provides a great uh, 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 great uh, example to us. I got money from Ben Stiller to do that. And so Smithsonian put up money, Ben Stiller, USAID, uh, and uh, uh, a few uh, 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 others uh, that uh, ended up helping support that center. There's some irony in this project. When Corey and I first went to Haiti, we confronted some people in the US government. You know, we've been talking about like in Iraq, in Afghanistan, the issue of do local people really appreciate cultural heritage? But the US, does the US really appreciate cultural heritage? A big question. So our first impulse when we had gone to Haiti after the earthquake is USAID was paying Haitians $5 a day to shovel rubble and throw it away. We said, you know, we got a lot of cultural rubble out there. Could we pay people $5 a day, could the US government pay people $5 a day to shovel cultural rubble and not throw it away but save it? What we found was cultural rubble was worth less than other rubble. We could not get the government to pay that $5 a day for people to save cultural rubble. In the end, when Rajiv Shah came to the Smithsonian, we ended up uh, signing, we ended up getting several million dollars of USAID money for this uh, uh, project. Although there were US officials that say, bury this money, bury this cultural stuff so deep in that budget that nobody could find it. Because culture is not gonna get great support. If this jeopardizes the Haiti bill, you're out. And so sometimes when we look and we say, okay, the population of Kabul or the population you know, of Iraq is not so sensitive to culture. We have some of the same issues here in our own country. In the end, though, Rajiv Shah said he recognized the importance of this project. Pat Leahy recognized that, although I fear that just like other projects in history, like the Monuments Men and other attempts, that sometimes you've got to relearn these lessons. And our leaders and our political leaders have to learn, relearn these lessons over and over and over again if they are to stick. So right now, my lessons learned out of this was, and I think many people have said here during the conference, you know, you gotta have pre-planning, you have to do training, you have to have uh, deal with emergency and disaster planning from the beginning, but you really have to have, and I think this is the biggest one I've learned, networks or a consortium of folks, of organizations that really are ready. You have to pre-develop those MOUs and the legal agreements between agencies and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations to have the framework to actually respond in a crisis. You need better research, better tools for actually operating. I think we've you know, all come to that, better analytic tools for prediction, for monitoring threats, for understanding impacts. 
you know, from destruction to looting and so on. Uh, and as we're doing here, some processes for assessing and sharing the results of what we do. To me, one of the big drivers here is money. And there is no question in my mind, we need, if we're gonna do this effectively, because to get money from governments, to have to raise money we're doing, and we have some models for that. And so I think if you look for something like Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders, they have money. They have arrangements. People have a duffel bag packed. They are ready to go. And I think we have to look at such models and have a big pot of money that enables us to operate. <laughs> Because one of the, the breaks within any governmental system in recognizing the value of culture is do you have actually the money and the arrangements to put in place to actually be effective? Because we don't want to take away from medicine uh, and uh, uh, food, shelter, and other responses. So I, you know, I, I think I learned I got into this you know, really as a, I, well, at some point we all got into it, you know, really not even not really thinking about it. But the sad one is, of course, that because we see you know, perhaps the uptick in crises because of natural disasters, increasingly so in the years ahead and decades ahead because of global warming, conflict that seems to make, put culture in, uh, cultural heritage in the bullseye, we really need to figure this out. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of experience, uh, a lot of good heartedness, uh, and a lot of good thinking uh, in this room and with colleagues around the world where we got to now figure this out and we got to do it. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to sit here. I'll sit down there. I'll sit down. Uh, good afternoon, or I think it's afternoon. Um, I'm Richard Leventhal from the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. And I want to follow up on what Richard said on a variety of themes. Um, I'm not going to talk about Haiti specifically. Um, we've heard a lot about it. We've heard a lot about the project. It's a, it's a spectacular project. They've even done a five-year assessment uh, that we heard the other day. So I really think I want to move forward and think about a couple of, of the major issues that have come up uh, both uh, over the last two days as well as in Richard's talk. And one of the, the issues for me is really the, the nature of culture. Um, I find it perhaps shocking and, and perhaps unbelievable that in the 21st century we still have to convince politicians, major funders uh, connected to, uh, who are going to be first responders in disaster relief, that we, that, that we need to argue that culture has to be part of what they're thinking about when they arrive on the ground. Culture is so critical of who we are. It is, by definition, what makes us human. Um, and it is really unacceptable that culture is, is not perceived as being critical. Um, human culture, unfortunately, is also messy. Uh, it's incredibly complicated, um, and it's not simple. It's really based upon, the, I mean, culture is about the relationships that we have with each other, the relationships and stories that we create between ourselves and objects and sites that are important to us, culture is critical. And in fact, it really comes out when, it, when I speak to my colleagues uh, who are working uh, in Syria and Iraq, and, and they are speaking to people in Syria or in Iraq, and the people there are acknowledging that it is critical for them to save what is important to them, what makes them human, what makes them Syrians uh, today. And if they're not gonna save that, and if the first responders aren't going to focus in on those issues, in many respects, yes, we are saving human life, but in some sense, that's the minimum that we're doing, and we need to do more than that. We need to focus on a broader framing of what culture is. It is about identity, uh, it is where we come from, it is who we are today, and in some sense, perhaps most importantly, we're gonna to begin to look at where we were going in the future, um, and why we wanna even go there, and that there is a future. The second point I want to talk a little bit about is about communities. Again, I'm going to use the word messy. Communities are messy because we come together as humans and it's incredibly complicated that relationship that we create with each other. And as we create communities, I don't know what community means. We've been using the word a lot. How large is a community? Is it a nation? Is it a town? Is it a city? Is it a town? Is it an individual family? At a certain point, the question of what a community is is very critical because in fact, 
within communities at all of these levels, we begin to realize that there are multiple discourses of identity, multiple discourses of who we are, and multiple discourses of, in fact, what is important in terms of cultural heritage. It's therefore critical, and I think Richard talks about this, we need to be talking to people on the ground. Not just assume that we know what needs to be saved. Not to assume that we know who these people are. We need to ask. We need to talk. In fact, I started out, I'm an anthropologist. I specialize in archaeology. And today in the community project that I do work on in Mexico, most of my time is spent communicating and talking with the people of, the, of this town about what is important to them. And that becomes really the critical issue. These multiple discourses are, are so important because, in fact, what people on the ground oftentimes see as important for them, for themselves, is very different than what we bring to the table. And so, in fact, I work in a Maya community. And probably every one of you believes, aha, ancient Maya sites are what the Maya community wants to save. Absolutely not. They intellectually know that they are the descendants of the ancient Maya, but that's too long ago. They're focused on something that's only 150 years old, a rebellion that they participated in against Mexico, uh, starting in 1847. And that changes the entire discourse of heritage in the Maya area. And whether it's Haiti, whether it's Erbil, whether it's Syria, we need to think about these different discourses. Have to bring up the issue of money and the, pro the Haiti project. Richard already brought that up. But I think it's very critical that, in many respects, what we begin to see with Haiti, but even other areas, the programs, in many respects, are so ad hoc because we need money. It's not put aside now. If there's a disaster tomorrow, we don't have money put aside. Fortunately, Richard has incredible connections, and so we can turn to him. But what happens in 10 years, or 20 years, or 50 years? We need to be planning now, but get that money put aside, or we need to have people like Richard who can facilitate the getting of that money. And the getting of that money, in some sense, is tied to the acknowledgement that people in many parts of our community are aware that culture is important. A lot of the funders are not, and that to me is really quite scary. Clearly, the most successful projects that we've heard about over the last two days are the projects that are working with and have teams on the ground of local people within local communities. That is so important. We can't arrive at, whether it's from a disaster, natural, or conflict situations, and make assumptions about what we're seeing there, what's going on. It becomes critical that on the ground projects and teams, and this is what's happening with our Shosi project, and I turn to all the people from the University of Pennsylvania um, and with our partners uh, working on the ground in Syria and Iraq, they are connected to communities on the ground. It's a, it's a basic framework of what we think about in terms of the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. We created it to think about how we can work with communities and think about how communities are tied to cultural heritage. And in fact, what we're doing on the ground in Syria that, that Salam discussed, uh, that other people have discussed, or in Iraq, is very much focused upon people on the ground. Those are the, where the successful projects are. And clearly, again, in Haiti, it was, it was not just an American or a Smithsonian institution coming in and controlling things. It was creating co-principal inv investigators, co-directors, co people who are making decisions, not just about what goes on, but how we spend the money, even if we bring the money. How do we spend the money together as a cooperative program in Haiti or in Syria? And that's a change of power relationships. So it's not showing up and assuming that because we are from the United States and we have the money, we're in charge. I have to throw that away completely because that's where the successful projects are. And so it is creating these internal networks and these internal frameworks and teams that I think allow all these projects to move forward. The final point I just want to make is that, and I think Richard said this, in a disaster or in a conflict zone, a lot of people want to help. And the real question is, how do we not get in each other's way to move that forward? How do we not get in each other's way so that we can succeed on the ground? Perhaps at times, finding those people who want to talk, and excuse me, you, I agree with you about UNESCO, 
putting them aside and saying, you can talk over there. Please don't spend too much of the money. <laughs> but you can talk over there. But let's figure out what we can do to move these things forward and not get in each other's way. And I think whether it was Haiti, and I think we can see that, but we can also see it right now with Syria and Iraq, we need to figure out how to work cooperatively, figure out what we can do, how to, how to get things done, and how to tell some of the good stories that are coming out of, of Iraq and Syria today, not just the stories about ISIS that make the front page of the New York Times. How do we get those other stories out to make it clear that there are people on the ground who are interested in, who are demanding that we have to work with the preservation of heritage and that it can be done today. So I think within that framework, the Haiti project was incredibly successful, but I think we can begin to see that there are other programs like in Syria, like in Iraq, and perhaps in the future, Afghanistan and other places where in fact these types of successful projects can come together to really do things and not just talk about it. If we can continue to do these projects, I think we can have some impact upon, upon the funding agencies so that in, hopefully in the future we don't have to try to convince them that culture and cultural heritage is so important. It's difficult because it is messy. It's not easy to simply say, arrive, bring the bottles of water and you're all set. This is a much more difficult process, but it can be done, and I think we're seeing it in a variety of places. We've talked about it over the last two days. Thank you very much. Richard, do you want to take some questions? I think it's for you, will be for you more for, than for me. Yeah, I think we can take a few questions. Again, I have to catch a plane, so I'm a little sensitive to that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have the microphone. Good morning, afternoon. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the previous session, so I'm sorry if you've spoken about this, but regarding the director of the Ethnology Museum who did not want the help, what were the reasons behind that, and do you know what um, the status of the collection is today? <laughs> You're going to ask all this. You know, what, what was frustrating in that is the person had a PhD from a uh, uh, American university, and we thought would know better. And uh, now there's a new director. So um, I think that's one of the challenges with the newly opened uh, center at Kiskeya is to try to bring in uh, the uh, Museum of Haitian Art, the Bureau of Ethnology, and some of the others. But it, it gets complicated. It gets complicated. Yeah. Aparna? Uh, Richard, first of all, thank you so much. I'm Every time you inspire us uh, with your uh, exceptional leadership skills and you have done a tremendous thing for Haiti. This project, very successful, very honored to be a part of it. But my question to you is, how do you see culture? I mean, one thing that I have acutely felt is that we are not part of the UN relief and recovery system and there is no cluster for culture and once only once, if we become part, a culture cluster gets in there, we can have access to funding. And we can, have, we, can, we can come, sit on the table, and talk about culture in a most constructive way. So how, how do you see, how, do, do you think, would you be able to support something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it should be. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the new, uh, you know, the uh, development goals and so on, I mean, you could find different points where culture is important to all of them whether it be in terms of social inclusion or economic. You know, we were arguing in the same thing with, with, you know, Haiti with regard to saying, look, investing in culture is not just like something people do on a Sunday afternoon. You're talking about the, DN, the cultural DNA of the place that is going to drive a future cultural economy, whether it be tourist-based or whether it be because you got Haitian kids who are looking at paintings in a museum and decide to come up with animated action figures on the web or new fashion or whatever. So uh, I, I think we could see it being articulated you know, with UN goals and so on. The issue, I think, is organizationally how you get there and culture, you know, even if you look at the, you know, look at the UNESCO budget for culture. I mean, what do you got, you know, like $30 million a year for the world? I mean, it's like nothing. And so, you know, my thing, at least in this piece of it, is it's very hard to tackle the biggest things in the biggest ways. That's a lot of work by a lot of people, a lot of institutions over a long period of time. I think my goal in terms of this space anyway, in terms of kind of disaster response and recovery, 
is really to try to raise a private pool of money uh, because I don't see it out of the federal budget, <laughs> if we have a federal budget, <laughs> and uh, I don't see it out of UNESCO's budget or res its resources or out of a cash-strapped UN. So my thing is, I think a lot of people are sensitized to this. A lot of people are aware. They just don't have it. There's no channel, you know, for kind of giving and supporting. And so I think it, there has to be a tremendous philanthropic effort and really build, I mean, a, a huge fund uh, to support this kind of work. And again, I look at stuff like Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. I don't think we'll get quite that amount in the budgets for a cultural uh, response, but I think you can get a lot. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Doris Hamburg from the National Archives. One of the um, challenges that we've had uh, over time is just communication and coordination. And uh, the meeting you referenced uh, that AAM had put together was, an was a time when there wa uh, was a good opportunity for co uh, communication where people came together. And as you pointed out, uh, it was a chance to know what people were or were not doing, as an example. Um, so there's really, it points out the need for understanding and knowing what other people are doing. We don't have a Ministry of Culture that would coordinate those sorts of things. The question is what, where are we, what is your view of where we're going in this aspect? Because it's probably not one institution that's going to end up leading everything, unless you see it that way. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are about that. but how we can coordinate and communicate. Well, I, I mean, I think, look, there's, there's a lot of need, and there's a lot of need for expertise, for context. I think in Haiti, Smithsonian took the lead because we had really a good relationship with a lot of key Haitian leaders. Somewhere else, we don't have that. Somebody else has that. That's great. Um, and somebody has ongoing projects. They should be, you know, the leader or the coordinator or whatever. I think the, there's, there is legislation. It was passed by the House, uh, uh, H.R. 1493. It's now in the Senate, uh, Senate Bill 1887 it is. Uh, and that actually calls for greater coordination among, uh, it, ha it has provisions with regard to the importation of uh, uh, Syrian uh, antiquities and other, uh, other objects. But one of the provisions of that bill calls for greater coordination. It cites Haiti, it cites Syria and Iraq greater coordination among U.S. agencies and organizations and with the NGO community. And I often find that the, 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 the deal, you know, the hard one is in the U.N. system and the UNESCO system, they're organizations of, you know, nation states. They have to be officialized. <laughs> That's a problem. And even in the U.S. government, it's official. And yet, when you think about, and at least with the U.S., the tremendous non-governmental sector, the ability of the American people to give and support things in a huge way. I mean, you know, this is a, you know, U.S., you know, America is a place where, like, people, if there's no fire department, they invent one, you know, and people make it happen. And, and, and so the idea of mobilizing that kind of non-governmental support, and I think that the bill recognizes that non-governmental sector is very important. Now, how are we going to get the government to come collaborate with the service organizations, the professional, the NGO organizations, that is a task of its own right. That is not difficult. That is not easy to do. But I think this bill helps at least provide a kind of legal legitimation for doing that, putting together a system. Okay, I really have to, ca I have to catch a plane, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very sorry, but thank you.